nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. As you know, in quantum transport, a method that is widely used is this non-equilibrium Green's function method. And there are several other talks in this session based on this method. And I thank the organizers of the IWCE for giving me this opportunity to share my perspective with you. Now, in quantum transport, you'd expect things to start from the Schrodinger equation where you have this matrix H, whose eigenvalues describe the energy levels in the channel. And we are interested in nano devices, where you have contacts across this channel, usually called the source and the drain, and when you apply a voltage, a current flows. Now, in order to describe this transport then, one key point is, it's not enough just to include the mechanics. You have to include what are called entropy-driven processes. So in semi-classical transport, for example, usually the semi-classical mechanics is described by Newton's laws, I mean, it's modified Newton's laws. And in the Boltzmann equation, the left-hand side is a, basically a reformulation of the Newtonian dynamics. But then there's a right-hand side, which is which represents the scattering processes, these entropy-driven things, which give rise to Boltzmann's famous H theorem. Now, in quantum transport also, you'd expect the mechanics part to be replaced by quantum mechanics, but then you still need to add the entropy-driven part to it. And when you do that in this NEGF method, this entropy-driven part, comes in through what are called these self-energy functions. This one and two describing the two contacts and this sigma zero, which describes the interaction with the surroundings. And these then appear in a modified Schrodinger equation through these additional terms. So this one looks kind of like that. It's H psi, you have a sigma psi, but the key difference is that H is always Hermitian. That's needed to conserve probability. But the sigma is not Hermitian. So actually, it leads, leads to a loss of electrons from the system. And so this actually gives you an outflow of electrons. And left to itself, of course, that would have drained the system of electrons. But then there's a source term where, which lets new electrons come in from the contacts. Now, what does that have to do with the NEGF equations? Well, what I'll show you in the next slide is how starting from here, you could get the NEGF equations. That's what we'll do in the next slide. But I'd like to stress that these are exactly the equations that were obtained in this classic work of the 1960s in involving Kadanoff, Bame, Keldish, and others. It's just that I've used a slightly different notation that's in the usual literature, you have a G less, whereas I have defined a Gn, which is more like electron density, and it's minus I times G less. Similarly, there's a sigma less, but I've defined a sigma N, which is more like inflow. But otherwise, it's basically the same equation. Now, in NEGF, there's also a current operator that you can use to calculate different kinds of current. I mean, just ordinary current or spin currents or heat current. And this was not quite in the original 60s work. This came up in more in the 90s. But this equation, this operator two, you can get from the this one electron view that I'll be describing to you. However, in this lecture, I won't talk much about this. Instead, we'll focus on these NEGF equations. So how do you get there starting from this modified Schrodinger equation? Well, the first step is invert this, that is bring everything involving psi over to one side, invert it to write the wave function psi in terms of the source term S. And then we write an equation for psi psi dagger. The idea is that, well, when you have multiple sources, if you are going to use this equation and put in two different sources, S1, S2, etc., you'd get interference amongst them. 
which should be unphysical because these are all incoherent sources. And so when you're using the this equation, you have to be careful not to add up independent sources coherently. On the other hand, by writing an equation in terms of psi psi star, the probabilities, or this density matrix, there you can superpose multiple sources. And that's what this equation does. And the psi psi star, that's gn. SS star, that's the strength of the source term, that's sigma n. And this is the non-equilibrium Green's function equation. See? So you can see this derivation is literally one line, getting from here to here. And this is how I have done it in my books in the past. But this approach, though, is very different from what you'd normally see in the literature, which is based on this classic work from the 60s, you know, which uses this many-body perturbation theory. The title of the paper by Keldish is this diagram technique for non-equilibrium processes. And the reason you generally need this many-body theory is because the general view is that resistance involves many-body phenomena where an electron interacts with the surroundings and gives up energy to the surroundings. And to describe that properly, you need this many-body theory. And before 1990, before the advent of mesoscopic physics, of course, the general view was that the essential physics of resistance or current flow is actually contained right here in these dissipative processes, the interaction, many-body interactions with the surroundings. And everything else, like the contacts or elastic interactions, those are relatively unimportant details. Now, with the advent of mesoscopic physics, what happened is people recognized the importance of contacts. And so instead of being regarded as an unimportant detail, it is now considered an additional detail that needs to be included. But people still think of this as the essential physics. So the new perspective that I've been advocating is that given what we know today, one should turn this around and one should view this as the essential physics and the other interactions being more additional detail that you put in later. I mean, not that they're unimportant, but I'm saying one could start here. And this you could view as a, I guess, a version of this Landauer approach, the, what was pioneered by Landauer. Now, why is it that normally people think of many-body interactions as being fundamental, as being kind of basic to resistance? Well, it kind of starts with what you might have heard in undergraduate. For example, that when I turn on a switch and a light bulb turns on, if electrons actually had to get from the switch to the bulb, it would have taken a long time. But the reason it works much faster than that is because one electron doesn't get from the switch to the light bulb. It pushes the electron next to it, and that electron pushes the one next to it, and that's how the signal goes. And so one views this current flow essentially as a many-body process where one electron pushes another, as opposed to a transport process where an electron actually goes from left to right. But the point I'd like to make is that this process you can model quite accurately with a RLC transmission line, where you have resistors and inductors in series and these capacitors in parallel. And in general, this capacitor has a component, which is this electrostatic component, and a transport component, which is often called the quantum capacitance. So there is a electrostatic component coming from electrostatics and a quantum component coming from transport. And same with the inductors. There's a kinetic component and a magnetostatics component. And usually what happens is this is what dominates, namely electrostatics and magnetostatics. Because if you looked at the velocity, one over root LC corresponding to the transport part, that would be the transport velocity of electrons, which would be much slower than the velocity of electromagnetic waves, which is determined by electrostatics and magnetostatics. So my point is that this model actually describes this signal flow very well and tells you why signals generally flow at the speed of close to the speed of light. But 
all that is not needed to understand the origin of this resistance R here. That I like to uh, stress can be understood fairly well in general without many body interactions. Although many body interactions could play a role. I'm just saying it's not basic or essential to understanding this. Now, one of the things we learned in mesoscopic physics is that if you had a ballistic conductor, then there's a ballistic resistance. And that is associated with the interfaces. And if you happen to have a barrier in the middle of the channel, like a little hole, then electrons do not transmit easily. And so the transmission is less than one and the overall resistance goes up. And this additional resistance is what you could view as being the channel resistance. And then there is the interface resistance. Now, this you could say, well, is experimentally verified. We understand this where the, the overall resistance, that would be like the Landauer formula. But what allows us to associate part of it with the interface and part of it with the middle, with the channel. And this is where the common wisdom is, if you want to locate the resistance, follow the heat, because resistance gives rise to heating. This is Joule heating. Anytime there's a resistance, there's some heating there. And so you'd think that if I want to locate the resistance here, what I'm saying is there's a heating right there or a heating right here. But that's not at all true. Because as you can realize that if you had a hole in the middle here, of course, the resistance goes up because electrons can't get past it. That's common sense. We understand that. But on the other hand, the heating is not there at all. Because after all, it's a hole. In order to dissipate heat, you need degrees of freedom because electrons have to give up their energy to the atoms, which will start jiggling. That's heat. If you have a hole with no degrees of freedom, I mean, you can't be heating that. So clearly, if you follow the heat, we'd be completely misled because you would then say that the resistance is really everywhere. On the other hand, of course, intuitively, we know where the resistance came from. It's because of that hole. So that's an intuitive feeling, which is not reflected in the heat at all. So how could you locate the, location, locate the resistance in a quantitative way? And that's where, is what I'd argue is, you'd have to look at the voltage. The, how the voltage drops, because this is a series circuit, same current everywhere. So, so wherever there's a resistance, there's a voltage drop. But that brings up many subtle issues, because when it comes to voltage, one of the first questions is, what do you identify as voltage? Is it the electrostatic potential or the electrochemical potential? And those of us, you know, those, when you work on devices, at least large devices, one thing you learn is current is really driven by electrochemical potentials. And so what you should look at is this electrochemical potential, which has two different values in the two contacts. Question is, what does it look like in the middle? And here, what you can show is it would indeed drop at the two interfaces and there would be a drop associated with the middle. And so, I guess looking at this, you'd say that corresponds to this resistance and this corresponds to that resistance. But then where did this come from? Well, that's where you have to look a little deeper into this concept of quasi Fermi levels. The idea is that right moving electrons have a different electrochemical potential or quasi Fermi level compared to left moving electrons. And the, for the right moving electrons, it drops suddenly like so. For left moving, it goes up actually drops right here, and that black curve is really the average of the two. Now, when you look at that drop, though, your immediate reaction is, well, if there's a voltage drop, there's a, there's a heating, V times I. But that's not true. The thing is, this voltage you should not associate with the potential of the, the average energy of the carriers. It should only, what it reflects, this electrochemical potential, is the filling of the levels. So what it tells you is that on the left hand side of this barrier, the, fill, the states are relatively well filled. As soon as you cross the barrier, they're relatively empty. And that is a very, that has a very simple physical reason. We all know that when we go down on a highway, if there's a construction zone, there's a big 
traffic jam before the construction zone. And as soon as we cross the, cross the construction zone, the road's all empty. So that's the physics right here. But it does not mean, of course, that the heat is dissipated here. Because the way you should think is, whenever you have a barrier like this, it tends to heat up the carriers in the sense the electrons have a very non-equilibrium distribution. And those hot electrons, once they flow away from this region, they get, they get rid of that heat. But where that happens, of course, depends, depends on many other details. So, but once you view the electrochemical potential simply as the filling of the levels, then you can see there's a perfectly simple reason why it drops right at the barrier, and it allows you to locate the resistance. Now, could one have modeled this with quantum transport with NEGF? The answer is yes. You could do a simple problem. I use this as a homework problem. That if you have a barrier here, you could calculate the filling of the levels going from left to right using NEGF. And if you use a coherent theory, coherent means where you only have the two contacts, but no interactions in between. Then what you'd get is that red is the semi-classical curve that you could get from Boltzmann equation, the one that I just described in the last slide. And then you have this black curve which comes from coherent NEGF. And you can see there's all these oscillations corresponding to interferences and stationary wa standing waves. But in practice, of course, there's a lot of phase breaking processes. There are all kinds of random potentials, US, which destroy these interferences. Could you include that? Well, NEGF lets you do just that through the sigma zeros. And if you choose your sigma zeros so that you get phase relaxation, then you could get a curve that looks almost like the semi-classical with some remnant oscillations right around the barrier. And if you choose your sigma zero so that it not only gives you phase relaxation, but also momentum relaxation, then you find that, yeah, the oscillations have died out, but you have an additional slope here because the momentum relaxation now gives you a distributed resistance throughout the channel. And all this comes simply by choosing your sigma zeros. You see the prescription is sigma zero is proportional to G, and there is this tensor in between which connects them. This tensor physically represents the RMS value of the scattering potential. And this is a tensor, and if you choose it correctly, the structure of this tensor, you can get phase relaxation, or you can get phase and momentum relaxation, or you could get spin relaxation, for example. But the point I'm trying to make is none of this involves any dissipation in the channel. That is, these models all assume that these are all elastic interactions. No energy is exchanged, which means all the dissipation is theoretically in the contacts. But nevertheless, you're getting the physics of resistance quite clearly. Now, I don't mean to Im imply that dissipation is not important at all. That depends on the nature of the problem. So for example, when I draw a picture like this, it corresponds to electron flow at a particular energy, let's say. And you're assuming it's elastic, which means electrons stay at that energy. Now, at a different energy, you'd have, again, another channel, another channel. And in the simple elastic theory, you're treating all these channels as being independent. Now, in general, though, each channel, when you actually looked at the carefully at this electrochemical potential, you might find what you have here is different from what you have here, if you looked at the potentials. Because in general, when you have non-equilibrium distributions, you cannot represent the energy distribution with just a number mu. You'd need something that, you might need a different mu for each energy, conceptually. conceptually. Now, what elastic, inelastic processes does is, effectively it gives you resistors that connect different energy channels. Now, if all these nodes have the same mu, then of course adding the resistance makes no difference because that won't cause any vertical flow. But if the mu's are different, then it could cause major differences. So usually when you have a device with two contacts, uniform contacts, and low bias, so the energy range of interest is relatively small, the point is each channel conducts roughly the same way, 
These mu's are all the same. So whether you included the inelastic process or not makes no big difference to the overall resistance. It of course makes a difference to where the heat is generated, etc. But no difference overall to the current flow because there's no vertical flow. But in general though that may not be the case. So for example, if you looked carefully with something with a barrier, you'd find that at these energies, because of the barrier, you cannot conduct at all. Whereas out here, at these energies, you conduct very well. And so in general, you'd find electrons would want to go up, would actually want to absorb energy from your lattice and go up and then come back down. And that would be like what you call Peltier effect. That would be a thermoelectric effect. And a proper NEGF model can capture all that. So I'm not trying to say that Dissipative processes are totally unimportant. They are important and they can play an important role in many physics, you know, depending on the problem at hand. And here I have assumed uniform contacts. What you could have, for example, in a transistor is that at the source end, you have a contact that stops here, that only connects to energies above this, whereas at the drain end, you connect to many different energies. So at high bias, you could have a situation like this, and then you tend to have flow that, there's vertical flow. And so if you ignore the inelastic processes, you'd miss it completely. Or you could have something more subtle, like a PN junction, where at the N end, you connect to the conduction band, at the P end, you connect to the valence band. And then of course, recombination processes that take you from one band to the another can be important. So in general, you see dissipative processes can be important. But my overall point is just this, that the general mindset is that, that many body interactions are basic to understanding resistance. And so any derivation of these equations must start from many body theory. And the net result is people view this NEGF as being an esoteric tool that is accessible only to those who are well versed in this many body perturbation theory. And here's a quote from a recent book that you know, describes this viewpoint quite well, you know, very succinctly. But my point is that if you use elastic interactions, then you can actually get the same equations just from one electron theory, simple one electron theory like we did. Even the dissipative processes, if you are only interested in the Born approximation, you could get it from one electron theory with care because you have to worry about the exclusion principle and there are subtle issues you have to be careful about. But you could do that. And in general, I would say the viewpoint I would recommend is that these are the NEGF equations which you could get from one electron theory. And then what method you use for calculating the sigmas, that depends on the problem at hand. So. Think of the Boltzmann equation, for example. The right hand side is the scattering operator and how you calculate all that, those methods have evolved. You know, you use Fermi's golden rule, which Boltzmann didn't know about. It came after his time. And similarly here, we can expect that these are the equations and as we move on, we'll develop different methods for getting sigmas. Some of these might even need non-perturbative techniques. In fact, the self-consistent potential you know, for Coulomb blockade and examples like that, people use non-perturbative methods. So all that, as you move on to different problems, I'd expect different techniques to evolve. And in the meantime, I'd like to argue that just the elastic part, that's relevant to many problems in nanoelectronics. And just to give you an example, you know, these days we are often working on spin transport. And in spin transport, you, know, you could think of a structure like this. And for this discussion, I'm assuming it's an ideal structure where you have these perfect magnetic contacts. This one which, in, which only injects and detects upspins and this one which only injects and detects downspins. So you have upspins injected from here, let's say 100 per second. Here there is no current because this only looks at downspins. And then here all 100 go out. And then if you put another downspin contact, no current flows. Now consider what happens in the same structure if instead of the downspin, we put a right spin, one that's pointing to the, a magnet that's pointing to the right. So here we had a magnet that points down. 
Here is magnet pointing to the right. Now what would happen is of the 100 that came in, these upspins, 50 would go out here. Why? Because these upspin can be viewed as a superposition of left and right. And this is a little different from vectors where you have the parallelogram law. And here I guess the angles are kind of doubled. So here you can resolve an up in terms of two lines at 45 degrees, 45, 45. Here it's like 90, 90. And that's the basic difference of the physics of vectors and spinors. But this is well known, well established. And the point is that this you can view as left plus right and the right part goes out. But note that this brings in all these subtle issues of probability. The idea that one electron, there's a 50% probability it will go out and 50% that it won't. Whereas when you have hundreds of electrons, you could say 50 will go out and 50 will continue. And the 50 that continue, again, can be viewed as a superposition of up and down. And of them, then 25 will come out here and 20, and the other 25 will go on and come out over there. So you see very subtle physics here. And you could imagine an experiment where actually you are rotating this magnet so that as you change the angle, when it's 90 degrees, you get a lot of current out here. But if it is up or down like here, then you get zero current and you could plot all that out. And people have proposed transistors, spin transistors, which are kind of based on similar principles. Okay? And whether those are useful devices, that remains to be seen. That's not the point. The point I'm trying to make is that subtle effects like this could all be included using NEGF in a straightforward way. You'd have a H that describes channels and you'd have sigmas that describe your contacts. If you want to include spin scattering, you could do that through sigma zero. And these days, what we are also learning a lot about is the spin circuits where you see, you can selectively keep certain off-diagonal elements relating to spin while throwing away other ones. Because one thing we know in NEGF that makes it powerful and also somewhat hard numerically is that it keeps track of many off-diagonal elements. And a major challenge is to figure out how to keep the relevant off-diagonal elements without being weighed down by the irrelevant ones, the ones that are destroyed by scattering more effectively. Anyway, so this what we learn here could be useful in general for NEGF. But the main point I'm trying to make here is that the common view is that these equations kind of require many body perturbation theory. And unless you know that, you can't even get started. Whereas my view is that these are the equations. You could get it from one electron theory. With a little care, you could even get inelastic processes from one electron theory, if you're careful about this exclusion principle and are only interested in the Born approximation. And the point is that this really should be part of the graduate or even the undergraduate curriculum. And with that in mind, I guess I've developed this course that I've been teaching for many years now, the fundamentals of nanoelectronics and quantum transport. And the prerequisite that I require, you'll notice, is very elementary, the type that all science and engineering students have. See? And I'd also like to stress that this approach, this one electron approach, is not just for people who lack the background. You see, even if you have all the advanced background, the point is the one electron picture still brings clarity to the discussion. Because when you have this complex formalism, it clouds many subtle issues. So there are many issues in spintronics that are now being debated, like how to deal with equilibrium spin currents and things like that which again, the one electron picture can bring a lot of clarity to. Because I guess I'll end by reminding you of this little quote from Feynman, where he points out that, you see, even when you have all the equations, in order to think, you need a picture, even if it is not exact. And what I believe is the one electron picture kind of gives you that physical insight, that picture to visualize the NEGF equations. Thank you.